Eagles Entertainment. Eagle Eye in the Sky is fueled by Gatorade, the official sports drink of the Philadelphia Eagles. Everything that moves, I don't care who it is. Let's go. Give me everything you got. Play fast, play hard. Let's beat these boys tonight in their house. Go. It's party time. It's party time. Let's go. You are listening to the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast. Now here's your host, Brand Duffy. That's right. On the week, we're talking about one final Eagles rookie today as the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast fueled by Gatorade continues. I'm Fran Duffy, and as always, I think we've got a great show for you here on episode number 335. At the top of this week's show, we've got Chalk Talk, where I chat with Memphis head coach Ryan Silverfield, who was gracious enough with his time to join me on the show to discuss Eagles rookie fifth-round draft choice Kenny Gainwell. Coach Silverfield was the offensive line coach and the run game coordinator when Gainwell broke out in his redshirt freshman season of 2019, and he offers outstanding insight into what Kenny brings both on and off the field to this Eagles team. And we're going to talk all about it at the top of the show in Chalk Talk. And then at the end of the show, we also got a great question from you at home about the Eagles defensive scheme. So we'll dive a bit into that as well on the back end of my conversation with Coach Silverfield. Before we get there, though, a couple of quick things I want to make sure we hit on. First up, I'm going to ask you once again, head on over to our Apple podcast page, throw us your support with a rating and a comment. If you've got a question, I'll answer it. Just jump on, leave it in the request box there in the comment box, and I will make sure we get to it here in an upcoming episode. Also, we're going to be wrapping up our reactions to the 2021 NFL Draft over on the Journey to the Draft podcast, where this week, our Journey series comes to a close. Two weeks ago, we revisited all of the times we discussed Devontae Smith on the show before he became an Eagle. Last week, the focus shifted to Landon Dickerson and Milton Williams, the pair of Eagles picks on day two. Later this week, we dive into Kenny Gainwell, Zach McFarland, Fearson and the rest of the Eagles day three selection. Some of these guys we've been talking about for years. Others we didn't discuss too much in the lead up to the draft, but regardless, we've got exclusive interviews, in-depth scouting reports, and everything to help you see where these players came from and how they can help the Eagles moving forward. And honestly, if you're not already subscribed to the journey to the draft podcast, These episodes, these journey episodes, tell you why. We gave you full scouting reports on Kenny Gainwell back in December of 2019, two years ago. We have the same thing, all the same things you've heard over the last month about him and his fit in the offense. We had that covered back when he was preparing to take on Cincinnati in the AAC title game in December of 2019. We were breaking down Devontae Smith and Jacoby Stevens, all the rest of this class in the weeks, the months, the years leading up to this spring. And the Eagles have a huge draft coming up in 2022, potentially three first round picks don't wait to get caught up on who you should know for that draft subscribe now to the journey of the draft podcast and get those episodes sent to your device each and every week and if you like the show there's no reason you're not already subscribed to the journey to the draft podcast that being said uh look we've got we've talked enough about journey we'll get this episode rolling here on eagle on the sky it's time now to dive into our chat in chalk talk let's get down to business it's time for chalk talk Well, joining us here for our one-on-one is the University of Memphis head coach, Ryan Silverfield. Coach, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, appreciate you guys having me on. Excited to join you guys today. So we're excited to talk about Eagles' fifth-round draft choice, Kenny Gainwell, uh, the running back from Memphis. This is a player you're obviously very familiar with. You did not have him for this past fall, but you had him for two seasons prior. Excited to kind of dig into him off the field and on the field. And I guess we'll start uh, with the former first coach. When you talk about Kenny off the field, you know him very well. You were part of his recruitment process uh, down there at Memphis. What is he going to bring off the field uh, to this Eagles locker room and to the city of Philadelphia? Yeah, you know, that's a great thing is uh, Eagles fans should be quite excited. You guys got a, a fantastic young man. He's going to represent the community well. Uh, the city of Philadelphia will love him. He's going to embrace himself uh, amongst all of you guys. And that's the exciting part about this kid. He's a mild-mannered kid. Uh, keeps to himself, but uh, he's going to get back to the community. Uh, the locker room will love him. Uh, he's just a good, hardworking kid uh, that will be excited to be a part of that city of Philadelphia. I'll share a quick story with you. When we actually played at Temple a couple years ago, uh, Kenny and I were walking the uh, y'all's wonderful field there in Philadelphia, and he said to me, he said, you know, Coach, this has always been my dream uh, to play for the Eagles. And sure enough, on draft day when he got picked, I said, man, how about that? So, uh, you know, he's a kid that's – that's his dream to play for the Eagles and it landed it. And so uh, he'll certainly be embraced by the fans in the city as well. 
and a big part of that fandom for sure. You know, his older cousin, Fletcher Cox, obviously uh, has been a great player in this town for a long, long time. When you recruited Kenny from Yazoo City in Mississippi, uh, what did you see from him as, as a high school athlete? And what did he bring to his team, you know, especially early on making the transition to Memphis? Yeah, you know, he's a, actually a quarterback in high school. Yep. Um, you know, a small city kid, a uh, small town guy, you know, very country. Um, but, you know, he was a dynamic playmaker. And I use that word because uh, he's explosive in every facet of his game. And you were able to see that in high school with what he did. You know, they, a lot of these high school teams put their best player, the best athlete at quarterback. Uh, I wouldn't sit there and say he needs to be drop back passing for you guys in Philadelphia. <laughs> but uh, he's certainly capable of doing a lot of things all over the field. And you were able to see that unique skill set uh, with him at quarterback. And then when he got here, you know, he was actually a red shirt. We red shirt him his freshman year just because we we're so fortunate. As you guys know, we've got now five running backs in the NFL from Memphis. And uh, he, he's the fifth one. And so we've had a lot of good players before him. Uh, so we were able to redshirt him. And then, you know, really this past in 2019, uh, you know, he's conference freshman of the year. Uh, just super with everything he's able to do with it. Like I used the word earlier, a unique skill set. Coach, you referenced that game when he, you guys came up to Lincoln Financial Field to play the Owls. Uh, that did not go in your favor that I was there for that game. But I will say, Kenny really stood out to me that day. And that was a guy that I was like, all right, this is a redshirt freshman, kind of dug into the background a little bit, knew that he had made that transition from quarterback to running back. How, what does that say about Kenny just in terms of what he had to put in off the field to be able to make that transition from quarterback to running back in just a year's time and have that level of success as a freshman? Yeah, sure. We won't talk about that game anymore. <laughs> so, besides the Cotton Bowl, that was our, our loss, both to Pennsylvania teams. So, you know, we, we don't want to travel up to that state too often. Other than it comes to all of our Tigers up there. But with that being said, you're exactly right. You know, that's what makes uh, Kenny so unique, right? Not only was he a high school quarterback, but then he came here and he was a true in the back backfield. Mm -hmm. And we have a variety of run game schemes for him. So it's not like uh, Eagles fans got to sit here and say, man, is he only an inside zone runner? Is he an outside? He can do everything, mm -hmm. right? Uh, G schemes, a lot of the same NFL schemes we ran are ones that I ran when I was in the NFL. And so that's what's so great about him is he can do it all. He can pass protect. Uh, but then, you know, the transition from a high school quarterback to a college running back at a high level, then all of a sudden now we're lining him up at wide receiver. We're moving him all over the field. Uh, it speaks to his intelligence. It speaks to his understanding, uh, his football acumen. And so all those things added up. Uh, you know, that's what's unique about him is the, the ease of transition that he was able to move all over the field. And you talk about him as a runner and just how he was able to fit with all the multiple run schemes here in Philadelphia with Jeff Stoutland. Very, very similar with zone schemes, gap schemes, inside, outside. When you have a guy that, can, that offers that level of versatility in the backfield, what does that do for you as a coach and as a game planner? Yeah, I mean, that's what's so great is you can line him up all over and it puts defenses in stress, right? I mean, now all of a sudden you're, you're saying, hey, they're in a 21 personnel uh, set with two running backs in the backfield. And now all of a sudden, Kenny Gamewell's lined up at wide receiver. Well, now you may want to change your defensive call. And so that's the unique thing about him is uh, as a game planner, a, a play caller, uh, it makes your life easier because now all of a sudden it puts the stress on the defense. Where is this young man going to line up? Is, is he going to be a receiver? Is he going to be in the backfield? Oh, he can do runs from underneath center. Uh, you can't just sit here and say it. Then all of a sudden it's third down. Well, we got to be careful. Is he going to catch a screen pass? Uh, so there's all those things. You certainly don't want to match a linebacker or safety up with him one-on-one -on -one because he'll burn you. And that was the thing too, Coach. You, know, you guys would flex him out and he'd be not just into the slot, but as an X receiver to the boundary. And it wasn't just all alert screen, it's going to be a jailbreak screen. He'd be catching back shoulder fades and making these running routes like a receiver. At what point did you guys realize what a special talent he was as a pass catcher? Yeah, you know, I think you get to see a lot of that in practice with, you know, being able to move him around. And that's something we've been able to do offensively with uh, some of our other guys. You know, a guy uh, that played the same time as him, a guy named Antonio Gibson, right, who was one of those wide receivers, who's now the starting running back at Washington. Uh, guys like Tony Pollard in Dallas, you guys know well in yeah. the conference. So, uh, you know, we've, we always try to push our running backs to see what kind of receiving skills they have. But you're exactly right, you know. Uh, Fran, before the draft, a lot of the teams called me, you know, coaches and scouts alike said they, uh, the hands of him and th those routes, you're exactly right, the back shoulder fades and you watch him versus SU and Tulane, some of those catches that he was able to make on the sideline, you say, wait, that's a running back, that's the same kid uh, that just ran, you know, a pen and pull or a G scheme, you know, for 20 yards, right, the same thing that we run, and it, that's what's unique about him is you never know what you're going to get, so it's very hard to put him in a box and say, this is what he is, he, he's so dynamic, he can be all over. 
And then when just obviously the year off this past year, opting out due to COVID-19, uh, what were you expecting from Kenny going into his sophomore season, his redshirt sophomore year, uh, and what he was able to try and you know, help with the offense? But then also from a personal growth standpoint, what were the areas where you're like, man, like I know the work he put in this past off season. I, I'm expecting to have even better performance uh, across the board. Yeah, I mean, he, he was one of those that worked his tail off all offseason and obviously opted out shortly right before the season. But uh, we were expecting big things for him. I, I truly believe he's an all-conference type player. Mm -hmm. um, you know, would have been ultra productive. You know, if he would have played a normal, if there is such a thing, normal college career, he would have been one of the most productive uh, players, uh, not only at the University of Memphis, but uh, also in the country. And I think more eyes and he would have been more nationally known uh, than he was. But, you know, those that have seen him on film, those that have gone against him, uh, certainly recognize what a special talent he was. You know, and the things that uh, growth and the maturation process of any running back, right, whether it's high school to college, college to the NFL. Well, the first and foremost thing is, you know, you want to see pass protection mm -hmm. and he is willing and able. And that's a great thing. I, again, I don't, I don't know what the Eagles plan for him is. You know, I don't think they're going to sit him back there and ask him to pass protect all day long, but he's capable. He's willing, but that was the growth you were expecting to see. Uh, he became more posh as a route runner, right? Spent a lot of that off season running routes just out there, not just from out of the backfield, uh, really trust as I started studying defenses more. And so that growth we were really hoping to see from that red shirt freshman year to that sophomore year uh, would have been outstanding. And I think what's going to happen is now, we know the life shelf of an NFL running back, right? It's three years or less. And now you're getting a guy uh, that may benefit the Eagles long term because he, he's fresh. He's got you know, no injuries. Uh, he, you know, he's coming off a season where he, he was able to just you know, recover and focus on things that he personally needed to improve upon. And so now you're getting a kid that's uh, ready to roll. Coach, my last question for you, you go back to the recruiting process with him. And you, you talked about his uh, being a quarterback in high school. Big picture, when you're talking about guys that played quarterback, sometimes it's a situation where, hey, the, the best athlete, we just want him having the ball on every single down. But from a mental standpoint, when you see those guys who are like, all right, this guy's not going to be a college quarterback or an NFL quarterback, but whether it's a, a running back, receiver, a corner, safety, linebacker, tight end, when those guys make that transition, do, they, do you feel like they bring more of that cerebral element uh, to their respective positions? I certainly think so, because then they're, they're so used to having a firmer understanding. I think if you just grew up and I'm just a running back, that's all I am. I'm just a receiver. Now, if you played quarterback, now you have to have the understanding. I got to know what the running back's doing. I got to know what the wide receiver's doing, what the offensive line's doing. Now, all of a sudden, I've transitioned from quarterback to a running back slash wide receiver. Man, it, it, it gives you more um, – of an understanding of what's going to occur on every play. And I think that's going to be huge as he transitions to the NFL is it's not going to be a whole lot to ask him to understand an all NFL playbook. Hey, you got to line up here. You got to do this. We're going to use you here. Okay, great. And I think that transition exactly right from quarterback in high school uh, to the success he had as a college running back will only translate uh, even more so in the NFL. Well, I think that, that cerebral nature certainly shows up when you watch him on film. That's a credit to your coaching staff uh, down there at Memphis. Coach, thanks so much for joining us uh, here on PhiladelphiaEagles.com. Stay safe, stay healthy. Best of luck to you guys here coming in the fall. Appreciate it. Thank you guys for having me on. Introducing Season 2 of the Return Game Podcast, Birds, Boys, and Bad Blood, presented by NovaCare Rehabilitation. When it comes to the Eagles-Cowboys rivalry, you think you know the whole story, but there is more. So, so much more, and we're about to uncover it all. And I think back to some of my favorite memories in the rivalry, and I remember exactly where I was who I was with, what I was doing for so many of these games. Lito Shepard's interception to ruin T.O.'s return to Philly. I remember leaping off the couch in my house where I grew up and nearly punching the ceiling. I jumped so high. The pickle juice game. I was actually on a family vacation in Disney World. We made sure we were back at our hotel so that we did not miss that game. 44-6. to six. I remember I was watching that game from a bar near the mall where I was finishing up Christmas shopping. Earlier that day I was with one of my best friends. Obviously we couldn't miss the game so we made sure we were geared up. We had a good spot in front of a big screen. We went through like 18 plates of appetizers that day. And I have these memories because these games meant so much and continue to mean so much to us as Eagles fans. So if you want to relish some of those great moments in the rivalry, be sure to go subscribe to Return Game and Eagles Entertainment original podcast. Subscribe now wherever you listen to podcasts.
Great stuff there from Coach Silverfield, who you can follow on Twitter, just like I do, at rsilverfield. And while you're at it, I'm at EaglesXOs. That's where I post all the podcasts I'm a part of and all of our X's Nose content that we produce here at Eagles Entertainment. And you know how much I appreciate everybody that promotes this podcast on social media. That is one way to support the show. But the best way is to go on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher, leave us a rating, and leave us a comment. I wanted to give a shout-out today to someone who did exactly that. Weiss later left a five-star review saying, Fran, I love the podcast. Now that there's some more down time, would you be able to discern if Jonathan Gannon would be more influenced by his experience with the Vikings or with the Colts? The hires on the coaching staff say the Vikings. What is the difference in the two schemes? The generalization is that the Colts were a cover two defense that rallied to the football. The generalization of the Vikings defense is that they were a quarters coverage team that ran the double A gap blitz. A deep dive would be interesting. So uh, Weiss, I would say here, the, the generalizations of those te- defenses I think are fair. Um, I think though with the Vikings I would say that while the double-A gap blitz is certainly still a staple, I would not call them a blitz-happy defense. Uh, Shiel Kapadia from over the Athletic actually just did a, uh, a nice job of presenting that over on the Birds with Friends prod- podcast. Uh, you know, they, they have not been a super, super high-volume blitz team over the course of Mike Zimmer's tenure. It's more about the threat of pressure, and that is something that Jonathan Gannon talked about recently uh, at his press conference. Now, to me, and when we talk about defensive schemes, I, I talked about this earlier this offseason, but uh, it's something that I've really kind of been wrapping my head around lately. And, and it's the idea of schemes versus identity. And this goes offense and defense. I feel like we get wrapped up on both sides of the ball with labeling an offense or labeling a defense and sticking it into a nice clean little box. But I don't think of the game that way anymore. Uh, and I haven't really for the last couple of seasons. And I think that that does go along with the, the positionless football kind of idea. But uh, honestly, just kind of follow me here. When it comes down to scheme, in my mind, for most coaches now, the only reason it really matters is really with verbiage and language, the way you keep, the way you teach it, the way you coach it, the way you speak it on the field and on the sidelines. That's it to me. Uh, it's what you call stuff on both sides of the ball. All the rest of it is philosophy. So, for instance, th- think of it this way. So, Kyle Shanahan, right? That's one of the more, uh, I-, I would say, the more common offensive systems you see around the NFL. A bunch of teams are running it. Um, and there are a few staples of that offense, right? You've got, uh, you know, it's funneled through the run game, play action, well-defined throws. You mix personnel groupings to create some matchups, right? Those are some of the staples uh, of that scheme. There are a bunch of offenses in the league that branch off of that tree. You look, obviously, what Kyle Shanahan does in San Francisco, Sean McVay with the LA Rams, Matt LaFleur in Green Bay, and all of those are a little bit different. Lots of zone schemes, lots of stretch schemes, but there are differences, right? Different wrinkles depending on their complementary personnel, the offensive players they have on the respective teams. But then you look at Arthur Smith, and and he learned that system from Matt LaFleur from when LaFleur was in Tennessee and Smith worked under him. The philosophy was the same when LaFleur left and Arthur Smith took over the Titans' offense. The run game, play action, defined throws, uh, those personnel groupings, all those same things, right? A lot of the same staples. But the look was different. The schemes up front were different. Instead of outside zone and the offensive line working laterally sideline to sideline, it was much more downhill. It was inside zone. It was duo. It was power with Derrick Henry working straight ahead into the teeth of the defense, much more of a smash mouth feel, right? If you look at Sean McVay, you get more perimeter run game. You get more jet action. You get, and then you look at LaFleur, and it's more pure drop back because you've got Aaron Rodgers. And with Shanahan, there might be more RPO, right? So well, the schemes are different. The tools are different, but philosophically, they're the same. And it's the same in New England. You go to the other side of the ball, right? So you look at Bill Belichick, and what do they always say about Bill Belichick? How multiple the defense is, right? How versatile they are, and the the, team, the, 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 the changes in the scheme from week to week. Well, when you boil it down, yeah, that the, the looks up front change from week to week. Yeah, they go, they'll go 3-4 front, they'll go 4-3 front. The, the looks, the fronts, the stunts, the pressures, but philosophically, They have lived by the principle of, hey, on the back end, we are going to play a ton of man-to-man coverage. We're going to play different brackets on third down, and we are going to put a lot of stress on the defensive backs, on the secondary. And then we're going to be really multiple up front, and that's where we're going to change our looks, and and we're going to try and confuse uh, opposing quarterbacks. And I think when you look at Mike Zimmer, if you've been paying attention, there's been a little bit less of the double-A gap pressures. It's not completely gone, but there's still a a little bit less of it. Has the scheme changed a bit? Yeah, but, but philosophically... He still lives 
by his core principles. He still wants to mess with quarterbacks and break down protection schemes uh, and create big plays defensively, create sacks, TFLs, turnovers. That's their bread and butter. So this is kind of a a long and roundabout way of me getting to my point. And, And I talked a little bit about this back during the Eagles coaching search when fans wanted to know if the Eagles should be looking for a 3-4 defensive coordinator or a 4-3 defensive coordinator. Regardless of the look, regardless of the scheme and the package, at the end of the day, to me, it comes down to the philosophy. How is the scheme wired? What are their bones? What is their foundation? There's been a a lot of talk about, you know, what is the Sam linebacker going to look like in this new Eagles scheme? Where's he going to line up? And, you know, look at Jannard Avery and Joe Osman moving to linebacker. They sign Ryan Kerrigan. Is he going to stand up? Is he going to put his hand in the ground? Or they draft Patrick Johnson. They move him to linebacker, right? There's all this talk about what that position could do. But remember, at the end of the day, what do we always say? And, and everyone knows this. This is breaking news. The game is played in sub package a large majority of the time. So we're, you know, I feel like a lot of attention is being paid towards, oh, well, what is this team going to look like uh, in their base defense? A large majority of the time, you're in sub with two linebackers on the field. Uh, are base downs going to look a little bit different this year compared to previous regime? Probably. But, but to me... The most th- the thing I would say that I'm most interested to see this fall is the philosophy that Jonathan Gannon brings to Philadelphia. Because honestly, we just don't know. We don't know. The, t- the team hired assistance from Minnesota, yes, but I don't think that necessarily means that this defense is going to be a carbon copy of the Vikings. The same way I don't think that Nick Sirianni and Shane Steichen's offense is going to be carbon copies of the Colts or the Chargers. I think if you go back and you listen to that press conference, I think Jonathan Gannon was being honest. He wants to tailor to what the personnel does best, but the core philosophies will remain. He talked about that hits principle that he adopted with the Colts, uh, you know, with, uh, with uh, Matt Eberflus, the defensive coordinator and and the identity that group had. Remember it was earlier this off season. If you didn't hear it, uh, go back and check. I believe it was in February. Uh, Ben Fennell and I went back and we watched that Colts defense from earlier this off season. We, we watched all of their turnovers and the things that we talked about that jumped off the screen when we studied them, how violent they were, how they flew around, they were fast. They sat back in zone coverage, they were aggressive, and they just hit everything that moved. That's a philosophy. That's an identity. He talked about, uh, this is Jonathan Gannon, you know, he talked about pressuring the quarterback both before and after the snap. To me, that's an identity trait from the Vikings and Zimmer. It's not just about blitzing at the snap of the ball every single down. We're going to send it after the quarterback. We're going to blitz, 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 blitz. But it's the pressure of disguise and the threat of blitz at any point in any down. The offense, you're the offensive line, the center, the running back, the quarterback. You're trying to figure out who's going to come, who's not going to come. And sometimes nobody comes, right? It might be a, th- a three-man rush or just a four-man rush. Will that be one of the core philosophies of this defense? Um, you know, I don't know. And we'll, I think it's going to be so interesting just to be able to see how this all unfolds. But that's that's exciting, right? That's the fun part about this process with a new coaching staff and new players. It's just seeing how it all comes together, how it all evolves. I can't wait to see it on both sides of the ball this fall here with this Eagles team. Again, offensively and defensively. But you know, I hope this answers your question, Weisselator. I think that when you look at, you know, is it going to be uh, cover four or cover two? I think that that gets under or overplayed a little bit. I think. I think. Look, when you look back at Jim Schwartz, they played every scheme under the book from a coverage standpoint. Everybody does. Every you, the Eagles were a big Tampa two team on third down. You know, we talked about the the cover two invert and things like that. But then they they came more of a cover three and man coverage team. Right. I, I think that the coverages. That's that's not necessarily the the bones of the scheme. It's more about what is the identity, what is the philosophy, and that's what I'm most excited to see. Uh, with Jonathan Gannon uh, and this defensive scheme is just what they are made of, what screw, what jumps off the tape when you watch them. Maybe it, it's it might change from year one to year two and year one to year three, but I th- I'm just that's what I'm most uh, most excited to see. That's what gives me uh, the most juice. So a uh, great question there from Weisselator. Thank you and thank you to everybody out there for your continued support of this show and all the rest of our podcasts here with Eagles Entertainment. That being said, I think that'll do it. Another show in the books here on the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast, fueled by Gatorade. For everybody here at the Duffy House, I am Fran Duffy. We will talk to you next week. The Philadelphia Eagles are now on Google Home and Amazon Alexa devices. Want to hear Merrill Reese before the season gets underway? Simply say, hey Google, talk to Philadelphia Eagles, or Alexa, open Philadelphia Eagles and enjoy. Learn more at philadelphiaeagles.com slash voice.